Exodus chapter 2. You know, we're going through Exodus, which, you know, will remind you more than maybe other passages of the Bible that, uh, that Christianity is rooted deeply in history, its reality. And so when we get to Exodus, you start to realize while we're reading real historical accounts here, this is from it's ancient, it's thousands and thousands of years ago, which you know, the New Testament is also, but this is even further back. Uh, but as we read history, this is history with, you know, a specific theological points being made. And so that's what we want to get, to get at. Um, but we don't want to jump over the history in order to just make theological points. And so um, we are in uh, chapter 2 today. And I'm going to sum up uh, what's happened up to this point. Um, but before I do, why don't we just stand? I'm going to read the passage that we're going to mainly focus on today. It's only a couple of verses, and I'm only going to read that portion, and then I'll do the review after we sit down. In verse 23, it just says this. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery, went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Amen. This is God's word. You can be seated. Again, so we have to, uh, you know, be brought up to speed. If I asked you about the Exodus story, most people in here is familiar with the Bible enough to be able to say, well, yeah, that's when... You know, Moses split the sea, and they walked across the water, and then the Egyptians, you know, there's a bunch of plagues, and uh, oh yeah, and then there was that one time when Pharaoh wanted to kill all the babies, and then, uh, oh, Moses saw a fire in, a, in the woods or something, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, it's just sort of all convoluted, but one thing that's really helpful about being able to go through books of the Bible systematically is that you can, you can see the timeline and the sequence of events, and so even with the first two chapters, it can get kind of convoluted as if it all happened at once, and it really didn't all happen at once. Israel was in Egypt for 400 plus years, and so what we we read in a matter of four minutes is really telling the history of 400 years. And so even before Exodus, just as kind of a runner-up to the Exodus, in Genesis chapter 46, it's gonna, what, I, what I want to sh- start out with is to show the situation that the Israelites are really in when it comes to the passage that we just read. And so it starts all the way back in Genesis 46, where what you're going to see is that the brutality of the Egyptians upon the Israelites was gradual. It wasn't all at once. So it was, it was increasingly worse and worse. So this is what it says in Genesis chapter 46, verse 34. It says, after I get there, And you can turn there with me if you want to, but you don't have to. It says this. um, Your servants have tended livestock. Sorry. Set the context. Joseph, remember the guy with the coat of many many colors? He had the promise or the the dream and and all that. Um, He ends up ruling in Pharaoh's household, you know, basically being over half the kingdom. Uh, Well, once he finally reveals who he is to his brothers and his father, who he brings to Egypt, he tells them how they can, you know, be able to move from where they're at, Canaan, into Egypt and be protected from a famine that's about to come. And one of the things that Joseph tells, um, you know, Jacob, his father, is he tells him this. This is what you need to tell Pharaoh. He says, your servants, he says, you should tell the Pharaoh, Jacob, you know, Joseph's talking to his father. And he says, father, you should tell Pharaoh, your servants attended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. Okay, that's, that's the key I just want you to hear right there, is that when Joseph brought his uh, brothers and his father from Canaan into Egypt, his plan was he can get them some property there by telling the Pharaoh that, uh, that his family are a bunch of sheep herders. But what's kind of ironic about it is that uh, Egyptians hate sheep herders. They're just kind of despised. They, they, they look down on them. They're belittled. And so what that ends up producing for Joseph's family is uh, a, a segregated area that will be 
uh, dedicated just to his family. This area, this land is called Goshen. Now it turns out that land is actually very uh, uh, ripe. It's very um, perfectly, it's a perfect type of land for livestock. And so Pharaoh ends up saying, well, you know what? Well, well uh, yeah, let, your, let your family stay there. And actually, if there's anybody who's especially good at sheep herding, well, they can take care of my livestock because we hate taking care of livestock as Egyptians, okay? So the point I'm trying to get at, though, is that from the day one, when the Israelites came into Egypt, they were already sort of looked down upon. But they belong over there. They were segregated and isolated in their own land, segregated and belittled by the Egyptians. That's how they began. But for the Israelites, for, you know, Jacob and his kids, it was better to be there than to be out in Canaan when this famine was hitting and they were going to not have any, any supplies. So that was sort of day one with Israel coming into Egypt. Now jumping back into Exodus, where we've looked at in the last couple of weeks, in verse 10 and 11, that's where it says, uh, well, I guess in verse 9, the Pharaoh says, look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So while they were living in Goshen, segregated from the rest of the Egyptians, but still on Egyptian property, taking care of maybe Egyptian livestock, taking care of their own livestock, it turns out that they're doing very well there. Pharaoh dies, and new Pharaoh comes to power, and he says, wait a minute, these guys are kind of getting a little out of hand. They're getting, you know, they're prospering, and they're growing more and more, and what might happen is they could, you know, join a rebellion against us if we ever have enemies that come against us. So we need to do something with them. But he hasn't, but at this point, his, his, uh, his concern just leads to somehow getting these people under control. And so what does he do? He puts them to work. You know, the, what I'm alluding to here is, being, is, is working for the state may be a form of oppression. And I work as, I work as a federal uh, government. <laughs> but anyway, but, but it is interesting, though. I mean, it's kind of funny, but it is interesting that that's what he does. That's what he does. He puts them in employment. Now, it says he puts slave drivers over them, but it's not the ruthless slavery that we think about uh, right away. He puts them on a project. He's, they build cities. They build two different cities. Now, again, like I said, this is all happening gradually because, it, the, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and neither was Ramses or the name of the other town that they built, uh, Pithom. So this is stretching over a length of time where uh, this is Pharaoh's attempt at trying to keep the Israelites under his thumb. Now, from there, it says that they still multiplied. So verse 12, but the more that they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and they spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and they worked them ruthlessly. So you see the increasing intensity with which the Egyptians go from belittling the Israelites, but, you know, they, they, they're sort of handy. They can take care of our livestock way over there. To, we're going to put them underneath our thumb because they're, they're growing to... We, gotta, we have to really crack down on this because this is becoming a real serious problem. And so increasingly, increasingly, it's getting worse and worse. Now, when that doesn't work, and we, and we know that this is all sort of, uh, uh, that it's all gradual and it's, I don't want to minimize it. I mean, it, it was widespread across all of Israel, but it, it wasn't as strict as it could have been because somehow the Egyptians are still prospering, which means men and women are still being able to cohabitate and make babies. And so there's some sort of lifestyle still being able to be ma uh, maintained underneath this, uh, it, regardless of how oppressive it was at that time. But as they continue to prosper, it says in verses 15 and 16, this is where it gets brutal and bloody, so, very well, I'll start from verse 14. It says, they made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar. So they got the cities built already. That was the project to try to keep them busy and keep them under control. Now they're just, just trying to keep them busy with anything with harsh labor. It says, they made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Then it says in verse 15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, undoubtedly there were more than two midwives in all of Israel, but this is, these are probably the, maybe the leaders or something. 
When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. And we know the outcome of this policy that they don't go along with it. But this is, you know, hopefully you see now that this is just the next step in trying to keep control of these Israelites. They, they just keep prospering, and the Pharaoh just continues to make it worse and worse and worse to try to crack down on this population, this is population control. And when that doesn't work, then he has to go to even more extremes from systemized infanticide. You know, this was supposed to be, you know, the midwife's job. And so just make this a part of your regular routine. But since that didn't happen, now it's just reckless infanticide. Anybody, it says he speaks to his own people. Any Egyptians who finds an Egyptian boy somehow, some way, throw him into the river. So this moves on to reckless infanticide. Verse 22, then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Now, on top of this, you know, as a, as a reader, we get more insight into the story than obviously the people who were living it, correct? Because we get to see from the outside looking in and get to see from different angles. So from that perspective, you can see in chapter 2 uh, the introduction of Moses. So we see how brutal and how bad it is for the Israelites in Egypt. Now we get to see the introduction of Moses. Now, if you were living as an Israelite at that time, you may not know about what's going on with Moses or anything. But as the reader now, we get to see this part of the story. Moses, who we, you can tell from as you're reading chapter 2, from the fact that he uh, looked like a fine child and, um, you know, he's, he's hidden out for a few months. You know, he's not just initially you know, or, or, or uh, immediately thrown into the Nile, you can see that there's something special about this guy. So you kind of see where this is going, because every story has, you know, an introduction. You get to meet all the characters, and then you kind of see who the villain is, and you kind of see who the hero is. You can see that Moses is supposed to be the hero here. But as the reader, when you read through chapter 2, you see where this is headed. The hero is obviously going to, you know, somehow save the day. But by the end of chapter 2, he's completely gone, and he's gone as I said, completely. Even in Acts 7.25, when Stephen is recounting this story, he inserts a little note and says that even Moses thought that, you know, when he had uh, saved one of the Hebrew slaves from an Egyptian slave master, that they were going to recognize that Moses was, was going to be a deliverer. That's what, that's what Moses had in his mind. So even Moses had that idea. But again, by the end of this chapter, you don't see Moses anywhere near the role of, of savior or hero in the story. Geographically, personally, and time-wise, what I mean is, one, he moves from Egypt, from probably right in Goshen, all the way over to Midian, which, you know, estimates about 300 miles away. So he's long gone. Personally, because it says that he meets a wife in Midian. So he's settled down. He's not traveling there and kind of wandering about. He's established and he's moving on. Maybe he got his calling wrong. Maybe he doesn't want the calling of going back to Egypt. You know, who knows? He was fleeing for his life when he left Egypt. And time-wise, because it, was, it wasn't as though he went to Midian just for six months or for a year, but then he knew he had to go. But he was, it was 40 years that he was gone from Goshen to Midian. So he's a long ways away from doing anything about the Egyptians' uh, oppression. That's how we as the readers are supposed to, are supposed to um, understand this story at this point when we finally get to the passages that we read today. So as, a, as an Israelite, now imagine yourself as an Israelite who is not, you know, is living at this time when, you know, you're forced under harsh labor and your life is made to be bitter intentionally. If you have a child, you know that if there's someone you can find to help you birth that child, that any Egyptian who finds that child who was a boy is chucking it in the, in the river. And then you also know that your parents, as well as your grandparents, have always lived this way. I mean, it wasn't as bad as it is now, but it was bad back then. They were working to build a city, and then before that, they were belittled and segregated from Egypt. They've never, they've all foreigners in a foreign land in Egypt. 
to varying degrees of intensity. So it's at this point that when we get to verse 23, we see the cry of the people. When it says during that long period, what period is he referring to? It's referring to the period when Moses has completely abandoned his call and went over to Midian, uh, and the, and the uh, Israelites are left there in Goshen, in Egypt, oppressed by their slave masters. It's, in, it's during that time. During, during that time, it says the king of Egypt died, and the Israelites groaned in their slavery, and they cried out. Now, there's three terms, and I looked, at, um, I looked at a few different translations, and I think I covered all the translations that most of the people in here use, King James, NASB, ESV, NIV, and Net Bible. And um, there's really three different terms being used here when it talked about cried out. The first one is just referring to, and it's, it, these two go together, the groaning and the crying out, or maybe your translation just says the cry, or cry because of their slavery. This is, this is referring to just the involuntary verbalization of pain and anguish. So if you, like yesterday I was working and uh, I, you know, grabbed this piece of wood or whatever and there was a nail sticking out and went in my hand, you know, you just involuntarily say whatever comes out of your mouth, you know? That's the kind of pain and anguish, that's the kind of crying out and groaning that happens that it's referring to here. Uh, by these slaves. And if you give birth to, or if you, you know, say if you're an Israelite and, you know, your wife is pregnant, you don't know if it's a boy or a girl, you could feel the tension of knowing that there's a 50% chance that this baby is, you know, may not make it, or it may make it and then end up being killed because he's a boy or whatever. And, you, and, you, and so you can feel the uncomfortableness and the pain that that would cause, the pain of your daily grind of working for no pay or for little pay, of not owning anything. And then, and then the, the puzzlement of, especially if there were stories about what God did in the past and, and the promise of a land and a nation and here you are with nothing to your name, and the one thing that you could take pride in your child might be stolen from you and killed. I mean, that's the type of pain that we're talking about. And all the inv involuntary groans that would come out of that is what's being referred to when it says they groaned in their slavery and cried out. It is important to note that, this, that the oppression is uh, sponsored, funded, uh, you know, by the, by the government itself. In Proverbs 29, this same type of groaning is referred to when it says this, when the righteous thrive, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, the people groan. That's the type of groaning you could imagine by these Israelites. But that's only one type of groaning or crying out. It's, again, just the involuntary vocalization of the plight that you're in. The other type of groaning, though, is it says that their cry for help went up to God. Their cry for help went up to God. Um, this is something I want to make clear, and I think it will resonate. Not all cries for help, sorry, not all cries are cries for help, but a cry for help is a cry for God. Have you ever seen somebody, because I'm sure it's nobody in here, but have you ever seen somebody who will complain uh, and, to use our word, groan over the difficulty they're feeling in their life because of what it's costing them, because they, what, what it's costing them monetarily or otherwise, because they are sick and tired of this and that. But one thing they're not going to do is ever turn that cry into a cry to God for help. Those two things are not the same. There are plenty of people who are fed up and just wish that things would change. They don't like the feeling of oppression. They don't like what is being taken from them, what's out of their control what they're suffering, 
Maybe they've even brought it on themselves and they're sort of fed up with that. But not fed up enough that they would ever humble themselves before God. These people tasted the pain of slavery, but eventually got to a point where that caused them to cry out to their God for help. You know, the first reference to prayer in the Bible is in Genesis when it says that uh, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And that's what prayer is. Prayer is a call on the name of the Lord. I'm going to read Psalm 34, 15 to 18. There's all throughout the Psalms especially, but all throughout anywhere in the Bible, there is uh, just innumerable references to people calling out to the Lord for help. That's what marks a believer. Always has been, always will be. Psalm 34, 15 to 18 says this. Listen to this. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and he hears, or sorry, his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That's a real comfort. But it's a real comfort to who? Because he has two different people groups here. Well, in verse 15, it said the righteous, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, as if they're a certain group of people. And his ears are attentive to their whose, the righteous's cry. Then in verse 16, it said, the face, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Well, now we got two groups of people. We got the righteous and those who do evil. To blot out their names whose? those who do evil, from the earth. Verse 17 said, the righteous cry out. There's that righteous again. See the, you see the distinction between two kinds of people, the righteous and those who do evil? One's got the Lord's ear attentive to them. The other one has the face of God set against them. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Okay, here we have another group of people, the brokenhearted, which is just synonymous with the righteous. Now, that tells us something about who's being referred to as the righteous, the brokenhearted. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. What we can take from that is that it seems like the group being referred to as the righteous are those who sometimes, well, at least in this scenario, are brokenhearted, um, crushed in spirit, but... Importantly, those who cry out, referring to crying out to him. That's what we find in Exodus. Now that note of a distinction between, um, using Psalms language, the righteous or the brokenhearted or the Christian spirit versus those who do evil, that will be important in a second, so keep that in mind. So moving on, we see the sight of the Lord. In verse 24, verse 24 says, God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. I want to deal with the four words heard and looked first. The point here is that God is more than omniscient. He is attentive. We heard that word in the psalm I just read. His ear is attentive to their cry. We know that God knows everything. You know, Arnie was just saying yesterday that it's so weird to think of, to try to grasp, say, you know, five million people are all praying. Uh, How does God sort that out and try to answer all of them, you know? And the answer is, I don't really know. But one thing that I do know is that God knows even more than those five million people praying. So if God knows everything, I'm pretty sure he can sort out the five million prayers. So I don't know how he does it, but he knows everything already. And so that's interesting and it's comforting and it's it's thought provoking um but you know we see that god knows everything you know as related even to this story because back in genesis 15 13 god told abraham this was going to happen that they were going to be in egypt for 400 years god never forgot that israel was in there uh 
Oh, I guess that's a typo. Sorry. God, that's my bad. I didn't get it proofread. It's supposed to say God never forgot Israel in their 400 plus years in Egypt. Oh, that's what it said. That's not a typo. I misread it. Is that worth to like write it correctly and then misread it? I wish I would have just mistyped it so I could say it was a typo. <laughs> anyway, God never forgot Israel in their 400 plus years in Egypt. In fact, like I said, he even told Abraham this was going to happen. So God is well aware that his people are in Egypt and that they're going through this generational degradation into you know, complete uh, uh, anguish. He's well aware of that. Um, we need to remember that. We, we really, really, really need to remember that. F- you know, would it not, what, isn't it, doesn't it stand to reason that the Israelites that lived, I don't know, 100 years into that, you know, oppression would wonder where is God or 200 years into that or 300 years into that, into that where, you know, it doesn't matter how much they know about their history, their grandpa and their great-grandpa, as long as they can remember as far back as they can go, they've lived in this land where they don't own anything, and they keep being told that God's going to give them their own land, and this is kind of like that because, you know, we, we have, but Egypt keeps telling us what to do, and now we're building a city instead of taking care of, you know, herds, and, and, and they're just living in this time where they know what God said, but they're not quite seeing it, and it just kind of seems like maybe it's just all a myth, or maybe it's never going to happen, or maybe they misunderstood what the promises of God were, because God seems really, really distant. That's the kind of life that the Israelites would have lived for 400 years, and obviously, I mean, I hope you can see the correlation. When we live between a time when Jesus said he was coming back, but he hasn't came back yet. And it seems like a lot of times he's quite a ways away. <laughs> I, I mean, we keep reading the, the book and we keep saying the stuff. and Like we know what, what's supposed to be coming, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> That's exactly wh- where Israel was at for these 400 years. And so we need to remember, obviously, again, that God knew the whole entire time, and God not even just knew, but God planned ahead of time this was the way it was supposed to be. When he told Abraham that, he, he even gave Abraham insight into part of the reason why he was going to do this. It was because the, the fullness of the, the, of the sins of the Amalekites, of the Amorites, uh, w- w- had not been filled yet. So he was going to use Israel in order to judge this other nation, but he wanted to let that nation get worse and worse. So there was there was a certain plan for why God did this the way that he did it. I don't know if these Israelites knew that plan. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that they couldn't exhaust, you know, exactly why the things were going the way they were going, why they were laying these bricks for no reason, and why their kids were being stolen, and God wasn't intervening. God, God was just distant feeling to them, seemed far off. Nevertheless, even though God knew from afar, as it were, God also was intimately acquainted. And the people of Israel, I think, at least some that were faithfully fearing God, would be constantly reminding themselves as well as trying to remind one another that God is near with them, that God is their God, and that God is trust, trustworthy and reliable. I love this passage right here in Deuteronomy 4, 7. It says, What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? Moses wrote that. Moses wrote Exodus. This this is the same Moses that was obviously being talked about in chapters 1 and 2 and 3. And he, he he would be one of these Israelites who could hold on to the fact, even as he was living in Midian for 40 years, I mean, he wrote this, obviously, later after the Exodus, but he learned that this God, who may have seemed removed for 400 years from, from, a, from a people group that he said he was committed to, that he was actually near to that people group, these Israelites, as they cried out to him. 
So God heard and he looked. It seems like he's afar, yet he hears and he knows. And then he looks. He looks upon the Israelites, brings his attentiveness to them. But he does this not because, just because they cried out, and not even just because of how severe their situation was. He responded with remembrance and concern because of a promise that he made long ago, hundreds of years prior to any of these people who were crying out. It said that he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Here was the promise that he gave, just to refresh your memory, to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation, and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse all, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Those are the same promises that years later, after Abraham died, not having seen the fulfillment of all those promises, uh, would be reiterated to Abraham's son, Isaac. This is Genesis chapter 26, verse 3 and 4. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and will give them all these lands, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed. So you see again the blessing to all nations, the nation for themselves, as well as the land, reiterated to Isaac just as it was given to Jacob, or just as it was given to Abraham, but then also reiterated to Jacob in chapter 28, verse 13 and 14. It says here, there above, there above it stood the Lord. Uh, I guess I'll read the whole dream. It says, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and the Lord said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. And what I think is interesting about this time when the promise is reiterated is the next verse. It says, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. But you know what happened after God said that in this dream? I mean, it was a dream, right? You heard that part. Jacob woke up from that dream. <laughs> and the God who said that he would be with him wherever he goes, all of a sudden, it's not there in the same sense as when God told him that. So Jacob was given a revelation enough to hold on to as a promise that God would be with him, but he wasn't with him in an evident way that he was in the dream that he just had. Um. That wasn't the main point I wanted to make here, but that was just a side note, I suppose. But the point is, the relationship to God is initiated by God and therefore assured by God. Abraham didn't ask God for this promise to be given to him. Isaac, Jacob didn't ask God to make this promise to him. God initiated this to Abraham and then bound himself you know, by making this promise, even swearing by, by his own name is what it says in uh, Hebrews, but made it so that this, these promises cannot be broken or else God himself would be lying. Remember the time when God even gave a dream to Abraham and they, he split these birds and then he passed through it with fire? Well, what that was to symbolize was that may death come upon me, God himself, if I don't fulfill this promise. And that's what Abraham's supposed to hold on to and then pass on to his kids as an assurance that, hey, no, God told me this is going to happen. I'll get a land, we'll have a nation, and all the other nations will be blessed. Now, 
in the time of these Israelites in Exodus, they've already started to see part of this promise to be fulfilled because the 70 people that came into Egypt in the first place are now so big that the Egyptians can hardly contain them. That was part of the promise of God, wasn't it? That they were going to multiply and have descendants like the sand on the, sea, on, the sea, on the seashore. So they've already seen part of the promise. So you would think that maybe Israel would, I would, I would think that the Israelites that were faithful or still hopeful were holding on to that as some sort of an evidence that, wait, even in this dark place, God is still with us. But that, the, the relationship that God had with, with his people, the Israelites, was again initiated by him, and so therefore we're gonna, was going to be carried by him. It wasn't up to Israel or anybody else for that matter. It was up to God himself to assume the responsibility for the safety and the well-being of these people. That's it. Here's a passage that came to mind when I was uh, listening to, you know, Julie said one time, you know, you're a good preacher, but you need to learn how to close better because you just kind of end. <laughs> so she's not wrong. But here's a, here's a passage, here's a passage that, that came to mind, though, that I wanted to just bring to your attention in Luke 18. Um, it says this, uh, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up, which I love the parables where it just tells you in the beginning or the end what it's about, so that way there's no confusion, you know? So the purpose of this parable is to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said... In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally, he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord Jesus said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, this is like the the twist. He says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? As if to say that the answer to the prayer is kind of the secondary of secondary importance. That's not the the real thing. Is are you the type of person who's going to just cry, or are you the type of person who's going to cry out to Him? Will he find faith on the earth? There will always be plenty of pain and mourning. Plenty of reason for somebody to question or somebody to play the role of Job's friends and come and try to figure out why there's this big distance between what, seemed, what, what, what you think should be the blessing of God and, you know, on your life and God himself. It looks like you're suffering unnecessarily and God is not willing to intervene. I mean, there's, gonna, there's always going to be that in this life. But, but is that going to cause you just to writhe in pain or, or to writhe in pain but bring that request and make it known to him? That's the question. Because everybody will be groaning in life. Everybody will be groaning all the time for various different reasons. But not everybody will be groaning to the Lord and, and waiting upon the Lord and mounting up with wings as eagles and finding their strength in him. Not everybody will be doing that. Jesus says, listen, God's coming, he's coming, he'll, he's going to bring his justice, no doubt about that. But what is, you know, could be doubtful is when he comes, is he going to find faith on the earth? Will he find faith in those waiting for him? When, when you know, when uh, we're going to see this probably, I think it's next week or in the next couple weeks, one of the problems that Moses has when um, God calls them, as Moses says, what am I supposed to tell these Israelites when they ask, who sent me? And it's, 
as if he's anticipating doubt, not a, not a welcome reception, like, oh, here's our hero, he's going to save us. He was expecting that he was going to show up, and they were going to say, who are you? And there's various reasons for that. I mean, there, there could, be, could have been stories that, uh, you know, that, that, that were passed down about this Moses who, you know, killed an Egyptian, and maybe that led to harder labor or whatever. There could be different reasons for why he would expect that kind of doubt, but I bet you that Part of the reason for that doubt is maybe the despair that some of the Israelites were feeling. There's nobody going to save us. Nobody saved us for the last 400 years. We're, we're less in a place of strength than we've ever been. What are you going to do? Where would you come from? And that ought not be the, the, the outlook that believers have who have been promised that we have a Savior who will come back and who will take his uh, rightful place in the earth, and save all of his people as he promised. Our outlook ought not be doubtful of that. It ought not be sort of hedging our bet because we're not so sure. Actually, we should be longing for that. And I'll tell you one thing. I've said this before and I'll say it again. There's, there's a list of tangible things I can say that changed um, for me just by coming to this church and how God's used this church, and specifically Aragon. And one is, I never looked forward to Jesus coming back until I came to this church and seen his eagerness for it and end all of his prayers with something about the coming king. And, and that's right. Now when I read the New Testament and I see them talking about, you know, in a positive light, Jesus is coming back, I realize, oh yeah, we're supposed to be excited about that. And even so much so that that fuels so much of how we live today. So anyway, in the meantime, as we wait for him, and it seems like maybe the time is far off. Sometimes, you know, it feels like it's closer than, than, than we think. Uh, but it can seem like God is distant. Remember that he promised that he will come back. And, and he will fulfill that promise the same way he fulfilled the promise to the Israelites then. Lastly, God has made a new covenant with his people through Christ, and the entirety of our relationship to him is based upon that. I wasn't going to harp on this much because, to be honest with you, I thought today was Communion Sunday, and I thought, man, this is perfect. Because, so I'm just going to read the passage anyway. I didn't, it didn't even dawn on me until I got here uh, what date it was. We're not doing communion today. But remember this. Because remember, why did God decide to intervene? Not just you know, sort of providentially from, you know, kind of working in the background, you know, be with the Israelite people, but actually intervene by raising up Moses and then doing all these plagues that we're, we're about to see over the next few weeks. Why did God do that? Did he do that because the situation was so severe? Well, it was pretty bad before that anyway, wasn't it? Did he do it because they, just because they cried out? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, they were, if they were praying, it's an answer to prayer. Yeah, but the text said why he did it. The text said he did it because he had a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because of the covenant that he made with them. Because of the covenant that he made with them. So the reason why that's so forceful and so important and so powerful is because is, is when you realize that in the New Testament, we as the people of God, those who have placed their faith in Christ, are also in covenant with God. Now, isn't it a comfort to know that we serve a God that's not just good in his nature, meaning that he's always leaning toward doing what's right. He will always do what's right. That's true. We can count on his nature. But if, if there was anything that could be made better than that, it's that that God who is good has, has made a covenant, has locked himself together in such a way. I mean, covenant is like marriage. That's what a marriage is. And what, is, what does God say about marriage? And then he uses marriage as an example of the church and, and Christ in Ephesians 5. What does he say about marriage? It's the two becoming one. That's how interlinked we are with our God. By, by virtue, by fact of his covenant with us. So it says in 1 Corinthians 11, and this is quoting Jesus, it says from when Jesus had the last supper with his uh, disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus' death on the cross, again, secured a new covenant between him and his people. And that's the relationship that we have in him. And everything in uh, the, the entirety of our relationship with God is based upon that covenant, that link that we have with him through Christ. That's why we're so ought to be so obsessed with Jesus himself, of all the different 
topics that religion brings up and Christianity brings up, the topic of Jesus himself ought to be our obsession because he is the bridge. He is whatever analogy you want to use. He's the one that, that blends our DNA with the DNA of God in a sense, meaning, you know, oneness with him. I'll take that in a weird New Age way. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, the, the point is that God, covenant-keeping good God, has offered a covenant to humanity through Jesus Christ. And if you placed your faith in him and been baptized into him, that's what, that's what we can uh, derive our confidence from and then even find an eagerness for his return one day. If that doesn't characterize you, let that, let that be you. That's, that's the purpose of, part of the purpose of our church is to herald this message to as many people as we can in our community and beyond so that more and more people would see the, the value it's such an understatement. The infinite value of knowing God through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, just want to thank you for your word again. Thank you for the fact that you worked in history over generations and then had it recorded so that we can look back and see the way that you operated with your people then and see the correlation in the way that you operate with your people now. Thank you for every person that's been converted and persuaded convinced that Jesus is who he says he is and did what he said he did and that what he did was on our behalf, personally, individually. We thank you for that, and I pray, God, for every believer in here, Lord, that, that our confidence would not be shaken, but only continuously and, and increasingly solidified and emboldened in you. We don't want to have shaky faith, Lord. We want to walk in confidence before you because that's what you provided for us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.